The 18-inch Mark 12 torpedo is the first to be designed for dropping from aircraft and is fitted with air rudder control gear. The torpedo is driven by a four-cylinder burner engine similar in principle to the semi-diesel type. The air, however, is not compressed in the cylinder but is delivered at pressure from an air the engine can be adjusted to drive the torpedo at speeds of 27 or 40 knots. The Mark 12 is made up of six compartments. Warhead, containing high explosive. The air vessel, which provides compressed air. The balance chamber, containing the depth regulating gear. The engine room, which houses the four-cylinder engine. The buoyancy chamber, which is airtight and contains the gyroscope by the action of which the torpedo maintains a straight course. And finally the tail to which is attached the air rudder for the control of the torpedo from the time it leaves the aircraft until it reaches the water. Other components of the tail are the horizontal and vertical stabilizing fins, horizontal and vertical water rudders, gear wheels, propeller shafts, and, of course, propellers. We will now go over the main components of the Mark 12 torpedo once more, with a sectional drawing showing their disposition within the shell. Here is the warhead, with its load of high explosive. Next to it is the air vessel, charged with compressed air. Then there is the balance chamber con containing fuel and oil bottles and the depth keeping gear, the engine room, the airtight buoyancy chamber with its gyroscope, and the tail. Now we will take the various parts of the Mark 12 torpedo in detail. The warhead of the Mark 12, which you see here, is charged with 445 pounds of TNT. The nose of the warhead is fitted with a pistol, which, on contact with the target, fires detonators and primers, which then explode the TNT. This is one of the types of pistol used. The air vessel, from which the warhead is now being taken away, is charged with air to a pressure of 1,600 pounds per square inch through the charging valve situated in the balance chamber just aft. This air, which is supplied to the air vessel by a compressor plant, is used to drive various components of the torpedo, such as the gyroscope and servo motor, and is mixed with the fuel which drives the engine. We deal now with the balance chamber itself. Here is a close view. The side of the balance chamber is cut away, showing the depth regulating gear. This depth gear operates the horizontal rudders and thus controls the depth at which the torpedo travels underwater. Here is another view of the balance chamber. The depth gear is removed, showing the position of the fuel and lubricating oil bottles. The depth keeping gear of the Mark 12 torpedo is an ingenious piece of mechanism which requires close study. The gear which you see here removed from the torpedo consists of a hydrostatic valve mounted at the base of this center column and a pendulum weight which you see swinging to and fro. The hydrostatic valve is operated by the pressure of sea water, which, as you probably know, increases with depth. And the pendulum weight is made to swing to and fro according to the angle at which the torpedo is traveling up or down through the water. The movements of the hydrostatic valve and pendulum weight are transmitted to the horizontal rudders by a mechanical system, the most important item of which is the servo motor, now on the screen. This servo motor, working on a similar principle to the well-known motor car brakes, 
boosts the power exerted by the hydrostatic valve and pendulum weight until it is great enough to do its job of turning the horizontal rudders. Watch how the rudders go up as the tail goes up and down as the tail goes down. The depth keeping unit is inserted in the torpedo through a hole in the bottom of the balance chamber, the torpedo being turned upside down for convenience and is secured by nuts onto the seating boards. It is at this point that the hydrostatic valve is in contact with the sea water and in order that no water should be admitted into the interior of the valve and balance chamber, this rubber washer is placed over the end of the valve. The water pressure acting through the flexible rubber washer tends to force the valve inwards. The inward thrust, however, acts against a spring housed in this centre column, known as the depth spring. The depth spring is of known strength and can be adjusted to yield to the water pressure and thus allow the valve to move in at any desired pressure. As water pressure increases with depth at a known rate, this means the spring will allow the valve to move in at any desired depth. The depth at which the torpedo is intended to run is known as the set depth. Here is a diagram showing in simplified form how the movements of the hydrostatic valve and pendulum weight control the horizontal rudders and thus steer the up and down course of the torpedo. Varying water pressure at the valve seating is indicated by arrows of varying thickness. First, let us take the movement of the hydrostatic valve. When the torpedo is above its set depth, water pressure is slight and the valve is out. When the torpedo is at set depth, sufficient pressure is, is exerted to force the valve half in, where it is said to be at equilibrium. While below set depth, maximum pressure forces the valve right in. Note the effect which these valve movements have on the horizontal rudders. See how, as the valve moves in and out, it moves the weight to and fro and the rudders up and down. Now, if we examine the three main valve positions individually, we find that with the torpedo above set depth, the valve is out and turns the rudders down in order to steer the torpedo towards set depth. When the torpedo is at set depth, the valve is at equilibrium and the weight central, giving flush rudders, sending the torpedo forward on its depth line. Finally, when the torpedo is below set depth, the valve is in and gives up rudders in order to send the torpedo up to its set depth. The pendulum weight fulfills a similar function, but whereas the valve is operated by depth, the weight is operated by inclination and is so coupled with the rudders that it tends to turn them in opposition to the direction the torpedo is taking. Thus, when the torpedo is nose down, the weight is forward, giving up rudders, and when the torpedo is nose up, the weight gives down rudders. It is important to remember that the hydrostatic valve can only affect the rudders by first moving the weight, which in turn transmits its movement to the servo motor and thus turns the rudders. Now, the connection between the valve and the weight is not a rigid connection but consists principally of two spring connections known as the upper and lower links. Here they are in actuality. These small cylinders contain the springs. The spring connections between valve and weight are very important, as will be seen later. To return to our diagrams, in an ideal drop, the torpedo would level out on reaching its depth line, in which case, the weight being central and the valve in equilibrium, it would continue its course at its set depth. 
In practice, however, this seldom occurs. On entry into the water, the torpedo is subjected to such violent deceleration that the weight goes hard forward regardless of the position of the valve. Up rudders will thus be given during the short time it takes the torpedo to descend to its set depth. The descent is caused by the impetus of the torpedo which the rudders are powerless to overcome. Generally, it continues to dive until it decelerates sufficiently to allow the rudders to become effective. By this time, it will be below its depth line with the weight forward and the valve partly in, giving up helm. Under this influence, the torpedo turns its nose upward. This should cause the weight to swing back, which would produce down rudders. The valve, however, is in exerting its influence to, towards up rudders. Here the use of the spring connection between valve and weight is seen, for with weight and valve now working against each other, the spring in the upper link allows a compromise to be reached, with the result that the weight is held partly forward and flush rudders is obtained when the torpedo reaches a suitable angle of recovery, that is, an angle of eight degrees. This prevents too steep a rise after the initial dive. The lower link is brought into effect when the torpedo has dived sufficiently below its depth line to force the valve hard in. This has the effect of applying the effort of the hydrostatic valve to the weight at a point further from its pivot than that at which the upper link is attached thus altering the weight-to-valve ratio. The weight is thus held forward longer than would be possible with the upper link only. This gives a steeper angle of recovery, 15 degrees, and tends to bring the torpedo to its set depth in a shorter distance than would otherwise be the case. As the torpedo approaches set depth, the valve begins to move outwards and the lower link becomes inoperative with the result that the slower angle of recovery is now attained. The Mark 12 torpedo is driven by a four-cylinder burner engine which you see here being parted from the balance chamber. This engine develops 220 horsepower at 40 knots and 48 horsepower at 27 knots. It is water-cooled. Sea water being admitted through these vents. The engine runs on shale oil which is injected through accurately adjusted jets in the cylinder heads. Here is a section view of the cylinder head. The air supplied to the cylinders passes through this chamber here, which is called the generator during which its temperature is raised sufficiently to produce combustion when mixed with fuel in the cylinders. The heat in the generator is maintained by pilot fuel supplied through this inlet pipe. This pilot fuel is fired by two igniters, which are each charged with cordite and magnesium, now being inserted into the generator. The igniters are exploded by twin hammers, which are automatically released as the torpedo enters the water. Aft of the engine room is the buoyancy chamber, which is airtight. The side of this buoyancy chamber has been cut away to show an important piece of mechanism, the gyroscope. Here it is. We have seen how the up and down course of the torpedo is controlled by the hydrostatic valve and pendulum weight the job of the gyroscope is to control the lateral course of the torpedo through the medium of the vertical rudders. A gyroscope depends for its action on the directional stability of a rapidly rotating wheel, this small wheel here being used for the purpose. We will take a gyro removed from the torpedo and examine it. It consists principally of a small wheel mounted on horizontal and vertical gimbals. 
Note how the wheel is easily turned when not spinning. When the torpedo leaves the aircraft, the wheel is automatically started by the release of this spring at the back. As soon as the torpedo enters the water, compressed air at 350 pounds pressure is blown into these cups, which surround the wheel through two jets in the horizontal gimbal. These two jets of air playing into the cups spin the wheel at 24 to 30,000 revolutions a minute. At this speed, the gyro wheel gains a high degree of directional stability, and as you see, the wheel is now quite difficult to turn. Note how, when the gyro housing is turned from side to side, the wheel remains steady. Thus, when the gyroscope is mounted in the torpedo, and the torpedo turns from side to side, the gyro wheel keeps its direction. And, in fact, the torpedo is turning about the gyro wheel, as can be seen in this diagram. This relative movement between gyro wheel and the rest of the gyroscope operates a valve which rotates as the torpedo turns from side to side. This, in turn, operates the steering piston, which can be seen here moving backwards and forwards. The movement of this piston is transmitted to the vertical rudders and turns them in whatever direction is required to keep the torpedo on its course. The mechanism for controlling the torpedo during its run in the water has already been explained. But to ensure a good run, it is essential that the attitude of the torpedo on entry be within certain prescribed limits. When a torpedo is dropped from an aircraft in flight, its center of gravity passes along an imaginary line called the trajectory, the horizontal component of which is the same as the speed of the aircraft, and the vertical component the result of the acceleration due to gravity. From this diagram, which shows a high speed and low speed trajectory, it will be seen that the parabola of the trajectory varies with the speed of the aircraft. Experience has shown that the torpedo should enter the water some three degrees nose up to trajectory. Should it enter nose down, the torpedo would dive deep, while a tail down drop would probably break the torpedo. This means that the attitude of the torpedo relative to trajectory must be controlled. This is done by drum control gear and air rudder control gear. Drum control gear plays a double role, that of tipping the torpedo downwards so that it will follow the trajectory and of correcting any tendency to roll. The gear consists of a flywheel and pulleys or spools fixed to a common shaft mounted in the bearings of the aircraft. Wires wound around the spools are attached to points on the air rudder. When the torpedo falls, it pulls on the wires and spins the flywheel, which, because of its inertia, offers a certain amount of resistance. The pull of the wires on the tail and the weight of the torpedo acting downwards at the center of gravity provide a couple which turns the nose of the torpedo downwards and gives it the angular velocity or tipping motion necessary to keep it in step with that of the trajectory. Should the torpedo tend to roll in either direction, one wire would obviously take more strain than the other and thus correct the roll. The wires are of such length that they control the torpedo while it is still in the disturbed air under the aircraft. The method of attachment of the wires to the spools being such that they eventually run off together. Now, a torpedo is an unstable body in air. That is to say that at small angles of inclination to the line of flight, the center of pressure is in front of the center of gravity. A torpedo falling in air has thus an inherent tendency to oscillate about, it, about its center of gravity. To damp out these oscillations and to maintain the torpedo within acceptable limits relative to its line of flight, a system of air rudder control is used. This consists of an air rudder secured to the tail of the torpedo and controlled by an air vane trailing in the slipstream and operating the air rudders 
through the medium of the servo motor and water rudders. Here is the air vane in close up. By a special arrangement, the connection between the depth keeping mechanism and the servo motor is rendered inoperative during the flight in air and the servo motor is used during this period to transmit the relative movement of the air vane to the air rudder. When the torpedo enters the water, the air rudder and air vane are broken off and through the medium of a changeover valve, the balance chamber gear again comes into operation to control the torpedo during its run in the water. Finally, we come to the tail, now being removed from the buoyancy chamber. We have seen the action of the two sets of rudders. The principal remaining fact concerns the action of the twin propellers. As the torpedo is a cylindrical body, the effect of one screw only would cause the torpedo to turn over and over. This is overcome by the use of two propellers, accurately balanced and geared to turn in opposite directions. Thus, torque reaction, as it is called, is overcome and the torpedo driven forward to its target. This diagram represents the various components of the Mark 12 torpedo together with the pipe leads connecting them. For the sake of simplicity, certain relatively small components such as non-return valves have been omitted. There are four kinds of pipe lead. Those carrying high pressure air marked thus with large dots, those carrying low pressure air, shown in this way, with small dots, those carrying fuel, like this, with a broken line, and finally, those which carry lubricating oil, shown as a wavy line. The final step in the preparation of a torpedo for action is one which is carried out in the presence of the pilot, the opening of the stop valve. Here it is. When the stop valve is opened, this is what happens. Air from the air vessel is released and flows to the starting valve. The torpedo is now ready for dropping, the starting valve being automatically opened as the torpedo leaves the aircraft. A lead is taken from in front of the starting valve to the bypass valve. You can see the air now flowing through this lead. The bypass valve is designed solely for use in the workshop so that air may be conveyed to certain parts for test purposes without opening the starting valve. When the torpedo leaves the aircraft and the starting valve is automatically opened, the air thus released takes two courses. First to the plunger reducer, where an important change takes place. The purpose of the plunger reducer is to reduce the 1,600 pounds pressure air from the highly charged air vessel to the 350 pounds per square inch required by the servo motor and gyro. The second course taken by the air is to the air delay valve. Note this lead which is taken off before the air delay valve and which carries air through a non-return valve to the reducer oil bottle which supplies lubricating oil to the starting valve plunger the air delay valve plunger and to the main reducer. The purpose of the air delay valve is to prevent passage of air to the engine and its accessories until the torpedo is actually in the water. 
for the engine would be seriously damaged should it be started without the resistance of water against its propellers and also through running without the cooling effect of seawater about the engine. The air delay valve is opened by impact with the water and air passes through a water non-return valve to the main reducer. From the main reducer, the air passes to the lubricating and fuel oil bottles where the effect of the pressure will be to force the oil from these bottles to their respective destinations as will be seen later. The main reducer reduces air pressure to either 620 or 270 pounds per square inch according to the speed at which the torpedo is set to run. The main reducer also supplies air to the breech end where it mixes with fuel to form a combustible gas. To return to the lubricating oil bottle, the oil forced out of this bottle by the arrival of air pressure at the top passes through a strainer to the engine and on through the tail oil strainer and rating plug, gears, etc. Fuel oil is forced by pressure through a strainer at the bottom of the fuel oil bottle through two non-return valves to the breech end and the fuel distributor at the front of the engine. In the breech end, air is mixed with fuel, making a combustible gas, which is ignited by the heat generated by the igniters. This hot gas passes into the cylinders of the engine, and there ignites the injected fuel supplied to the engine by the fuel distributor. The torpedo is now underway in full pursuit of its objective. We deal now with the horizontal rudders, which must be carefully checked to ensure they will give the amount of up and down helm required by the depth keeping mechanism, adjusting if necessary at the star wheel on the servo motor slide. According to the conditions under which the torpedo will be dropped, certain settings are made. The first of these is the setting of the ordered speed on the main reducer, which in this case is the high speed setting of 40 knots. Then set the ordered depth. This will vary according to the type of touch ship. In this case, it is 12 feet. The Mark 12 is fitted with horizontal rudder controlling gear, which can be set to fix the position of the horizontal rudders until a predetermined number of engine revolutions have run off, which in this case is 75. So much for the settings. At this point, the igniters are inserted. First, cock the twin hammers. Remove the breech blocks and igniter sheaths. Compare the igniters to ensure that they are of different lot numbers. This lessens the chance of fitting two igniters from a lot which may be faulty. The igniters are inserted in the sheaths, which in turn are replaced in the generator, and the breech blocks and cover plate fitted. The shell of the torpedo is now oiled over to prevent corrosion. The non-commissioned officer in charge of shop checks over all settings. He sees that drain screws are in place, that all cover plates and screws are tightened up, and that the air delay flap is cocked. This brings the torpedo to the ready or action condition. In this condition, the stop valve is of course closed, the air lever pinned forward, and the propeller clamp is on. 
the air rudder and wind vane will normally be off and if a contact pistol is to be used it will be held in readiness for insertion later. For loading on it is desirable that the aircraft should be on a concrete or tarmac surface as this facilitates the positioning of the torpedo under the aircraft. The trolley is wheeled into position so that the locating lug on top of the torpedo is below the corresponding fitting in the aircraft. The exact procedure varies with the aircraft in use. In the type shown, the torpedo is raised into position by a winch loading gear attached to the aircraft. Before the torpedo is raised into position, the primers and pistol are inserted. The pistol will have previously been fitted with detonators at a point remote from the aircraft. On striking a target, the detonators in the pistol are fired. This explodes the primers, which in turn explode the TNT in the warhead. The torpedo is now hoisted into position. The exact position of the torpedo relative to the aircraft is fixed by a projection on the upper surface of the torpedo, the locating lug, which registers with a corresponding recess in the structure of the aircraft. Now comes the operation of fitting the air rudder, which controls the flight of the torpedo in air. The wind vane is fitted. Both air rudder and wind vane will have been fitted to the torpedo and adjusted during a previous routine. The drum control wires are attached to the air rudder and the hooked eyes closed to ensure that the wires do not come off while the torpedo is in the air. The hoisting gear is removed. The air lever fid is placed in, in position and the safety pin withdrawn. The propeller clamp is removed and the propellers placed in the starting position. In the presence of the pilot, the stop valve is opened. and the safety fork removed from the pistol if the latter is of contact type. It now remains only for the engines to be run up, the chocks removed, and all is ready for the pilot to take off in search of his target.